on? What happened? I don't know. I'm having some issues. Ugh. Time for a new pair of boots. Yep. You've had a great day. The diving's perfect, and the last thing anyone expects to happen does. Trouble. It looks like Rick might be in trouble. Why don't you throw him a line? Okay. I need your help. Someone has to help. Point out to Rick. Don't lose What if that someone is you? Do you know what to do? How to manage an emergency? As a certified Patty rescue diver, you will. Through the Patty Rescue Diver course, you learn diver rescue skills and dive emergency management. You learn to expand your awareness of diver safety, your own, and others, so that you increase your skill at preventing accidents as well as handling them. The Patty Rescue Diver course consists of five sections. Each section consists of a rescue training session and a knowledge development session. During the rescue training sessions, you'll develop and master fundamental accident prevention, rescue, and emergency management skills in a pool or shallow, calm, open water site. You'll master 10 distinct rescue exercises over the course of these five sessions. The knowledge development portion teaches you the principles and information you apply in the rescue training sessions. You'll complete these primarily through independent study with this video and the Patty Rescue Diver Manual, followed by brief reviews with your instructor. You earn the Patty Rescue Diver certification after you complete the four rescue scenarios. These scenarios present simulated diver emergencies in a typical open water environment. During each, you and your classmates further your training by applying what you've learned to realistic situations presented by your instructor. Don't be surprised if becoming a paddy rescue diver gets you thinking about becoming a paddy dive master. Rescue diver certification means you've passed your more internal focus and now pay increasing attention to the safety of other divers as well as your own. That's a mark of leadership and your first step into the upper levels of diving. Section 1 looks at what causes divers to get in trouble and what you need to consider before trying to help someone. You'll learn about types of stress, how they contribute to dive accidents and what to do about it. Next, you'll get the basics on first aid kits and oxygen systems, followed by an overview of your possible roles at an accident scene. This section includes the principles and skills you'll practice in rescue training session one, including self-rescue and aiding tired divers and panic divers. The first step in preventing and handling diving emergencies is understanding what causes them. Though rare, an emergency can arise on a well-planned dive with properly qualified divers due to undiagnosed medical conditions, sudden environmental changes, or other unanticipated variables. But the main reason divers end up needing help is poor judgement, such as diving without proper safety checks, with malfunctioning gear, in poor conditions, or beyond personal limits. Remember that diving planning involves risk assessment. Good judgement avoids accidents, and you need it before a rescue too. When an emergency arises, consider first if you can assist from a safe place. If you must go in the water, consider whether you have the right equipment and the ability, given the situation, to perform the rescue without getting into trouble yourself. Diver emergencies involve stress a mental and or physical tension that causes emotional, mental and physical changes. Stress can be positive or negative, depending upon how the diver reacts to it. Physical stress can result from seasickness, being overheated, overexertion, illness, injury, improper gear and other physical influences. 
Physical stress doesn't have to be a problem if you exercise good judgment and apply a reasonable solution, like cancelling the dive until you feel better. But it can also be a source of psychological stress, which is stress caused by fear. For example, a tired diver may fear not being able to reach the boat in a strong current. Besides physical stress, psychological stress arises from other factors, like task loading, real or imagined fears about the dive, or feeling peer pressured into making a dive the diver doesn't feel good about. In the early stages, you may see stress as a behaviour change, such as becoming sullen or overly talkative. Whether stress leads to a solution or contributes to or causes an emergency depends upon what the diver does with it. When the diver perceives a problem, real or imagined, stress results with physical and psychological responses. We all tolerate stress to varying degrees. If the diver recognises the stress and its cause and reacts by reducing activity, controlling breathing and problem solving, then the stress can have a positive response. If the diver doesn't recognise the stress or disregards its cause due to something like peer pressure, anxiety rises, accompanied by the body's physical responses. These contribute to the stress and add to the cycle. Further events may reinforce the fear and raise stress even more, contributing to the cycle. If this cycle goes unchecked, stress may continue to rise. Mounting stress or a new problem cropping up may overwhelm the diver, resulting in uncontrolled instinctive behaviour. The diver may experience perceptual narrowing and fixate on a single ineffective solution while overlooking obvious ones. This irrational instinctive release is panic, which can be active like this or less commonly, passive, when the victim essentially freezes into a trance-like state. Without intervention, a panic diver like this will eventually collapse from exhaustion and probably drown. If the solution works, then stress falls and panic isn't likely. Or, if it doesn't work, but the diver stops, thinks, and then continues applying his training and common sense to problem solving, he stays in control, avoids panic, and arrives at a new solution. The ability to stay in control varies with individual characteristics, with training and experience among the most important factors in preventing panic. Now let's look at some of the emergency-specific equipment you'll be using in the Paddy Rescue Diver course. You should already be familiar with first aid kits from your emergency first response training. As a rescue diver, plan to have a well-stocked first aid kit on hand when you dive. Along with the items recommended in the Paddy Rescue Diver Manual, include a pocket mask in your first aid kit. The pocket mask simplifies making a seal and reducing infection risk when providing rescue breaths. It's also one of the most effective ways to provide rescue breaths in the water. You'll practice in-water rescue breathing with a pocket mask in Rescue Training Session 4. You may also find pocket masks stored with emergency oxygen systems. Research shows that administering oxygen is one of the most important first aid steps for a diver with suspected decompression sickness or lung overexpansion injuries. In this course, you'll learn the basics for supplying emergency oxygen to breathing and non-breathing divers. You'll learn to use non-resuscitator demand valve units, like this, for breathing divers. These systems deliver 100% oxygen and operate much like your scuba gear. You'll also learn to use free-flow oxygen for non-breathing divers or those breathing very weakly. Free flow oxygen doesn't deliver 100% oxygen and is more wasteful, but it's the only option for someone who's not breathing or breathing weakly. Automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, are devices that analyse a heartbeat and deliver a shock to restore normal heartbeat if needed. As you probably learned in your emergency first response course, AEDs increase the chance of surviving cardiac arrest by minimising delay in attempts to restart the heart. 
Depending upon availability and local restrictions, if any, your instructor may include AED practice with your rescue diver training. Let's turn our attention to your roles as a rescue diver with accident management, starting with the terms victim and patient. These have important specific meanings. A victim is someone who needs to be rescued or who is being helped but is not yet in a secure environment. A patient is someone receiving emergency medical care in a secure environment. A non-breathing diver in the water is a victim. Receiving first aid and CPR out of the water, the same diver is a patient. You'll learn to apply this distinction throughout the course. As a paddy rescue diver, you can make a difference when an accident happens. But your role in managing an emergency will vary. If you're the most trained and qualified diver, chances are you'll take charge and direct the effort. With a more qualified diver like a dive master present, you'll probably function as a skilled assistant. Whatever your role, being prepared personally and with the right equipment makes you more effective as a rescuer. Stay in good health and fitness. Keep your skills sharp and follow safe diving practices. Know where to find the equipment listed in your Paddy Rescue Diver Manual and how to use it. Preparation sets the stage for the six basic steps of emergency management. You want to be ready to act by anticipating where a problem is likely to occur and thinking about what you would do. If an emergency arises, the first step is to stop and think before you act. Step 2. Act on your plan. If you're the most qualified diver present, the third step is to delegate. Have others assist with the rescue, contact help, prepare emergency equipment and so forth within their qualifications. Step 4. Once out of the water, assure first aid, basic life support, emergency oxygen or other appropriate aid for the patient. Depending upon the situation, contact the local emergency medical system and the Divers Alert Network or other local diver emergency system. Steps 5 and 6 may pertain to more serious emergencies, with 5 being to coordinate activities and to administrate by gathering information for accident reports, for contacting the patient's family and to provide to emergency personnel. Step 6 is to arrange for evacuating the patient into emergency medical care and, in the case of a pressure-related injury, assure communication with DAN or other appropriate local diver emergency service. You may have noticed that Steps 4, 5 and 6 involve contacting help. A local emergency assistance plan saves time in an emergency by providing contact information for local emergency medical services police, coast guard or other appropriate services. You should also list the emergency number for DAN, the Divers Alert Network, or other appropriate local diver emergency service. Your instructor will tell you what contact information applies to your area. Now that you know the basics in accident management, let's look at the specific ways for responding to diver emergencies. Starting with how to stay out of trouble yourself and what to do if you have a problem. Remember, you can't help anyone if you're in trouble. You're best able to stay out of trouble or to self-rescue by staying fit and healthy, keeping your skills sharp and diving within your limits, and by having personal emergency equipment like signalling devices. Good buoyancy control saves your energy and mastering airway control lets you breathe past small amounts of water when dealing with a problem. Practice self-rescue skills like cramp removal, out-of-air ascents, and responding to disorientation periodically so you're ready to use these skills if you need them. Maintain your gear as the manufacturer recommends and inspect it before diving. Think about potential hazards and avoid them when planning dives. Watch for problems and don't ignore them, even small ones. Many accidents result from when seemingly trivial problems snowball into an emergency. If you have a problem, do what you do when helping someone else. Stop, 
Think, breathe, and then act. Act logically, not instinctively. Make a habit of visualizing possible problems and how to handle them. Now let's look at helping other divers. While it's often obvious when others need help, sometimes it's not. It's important to recognize the subtle signs because they often allow you to intervene before the situation gets dramatically worse. As you recall, stress and anxiety rise before full blown panic results. If you can spot it and provide assistance, that can end the problem. But scuba equipment and distance can mask the more subtle signs, and a victim may not ask for help. Signs can be subtle or conspicuous. Going from the least serious indicators to the most, watch for these surface trouble signs signaling for help, struggling at or below the surface, high treading as if trying to swim out of the water. Rejecting the mask and regulator, climbing onto anything available to escape the water, and apparent unresponsiveness. You'll learn about helping unresponsive divers later in the course. For now, let's look at the two responsive diver at surface rescue situations the tired diver and the panic diver. A tired diver is a diver with a problem but who is in control. Although we call this victim a tired diver, the actual problem may be cramps, injury, or a problem other than exhaustion. Tired divers often signal for help. They respond to directions if able, keep their mask and regulator in place, and can assist with their own rescue. Panic divers have lost control and abandoned their training and rational action. They usually reject their gear and fail to establish buoyancy. They don't respond to commands or questions and will attempt to climb on anyone or anything to get out of the water. They will continue to struggle until rescued or exhausted. Handling a panic diver is one of the most hazardous situations for the rescuer. If the rescuer doesn't use proper techniques and caution, a panic diver can climb on and overpower him. What starts as an assist for a tired diver can become a panic diver rescue almost without warning. When someone needs help, your first priority is you. This isn't selfish, but for the victim's sake. If you get in trouble, you can't help. And two victims divides the remaining rescue resources. So think about the most effective way to help while keeping yourself reasonably safe. If you're on a boat or shore, getting in the water should be your last resort. Your first thought should be a non swimming assist if possible. The simplest is to reach the victim. Lie down and spread your legs for stability and reach with one hand so you can't be pulled in yourself. Better yet, extend something to the victim. You can reach farther and let go if the victim starts to pull you in. If the victim's too far to reach, throw flotation and a line. In a pinch, anything with good buoyancy will work. Throw flotation even if you don't have a line because it may solve the immediate problem while you find another way to reach the victim. If the victim's too far to reach from shore and you have nothing to throw, you may be able to use a wading assist. Go no deeper than chest high and extend something to the victim. If the water is dangerously cold, don't try this unless you're wearing appropriate exposure protection. If you can't reach, throw, or wade to the victim, your next option is to use a boat or other reasonably stable watercraft. Approach from downwind so the boat doesn't blow over the victim and reach for the victim like you just learned. You'll practice reaching and throwing assists in rescue training session two. When a non swimming assist isn't possible or you're already in the water, you'll use a swimming assist. You'll practice these in rescue training session one. Let's look at these steps, beginning with how to help tired divers. Swim to the victim with your head up, eyes on the victim so you don't lose track of him. Pace your swim to be fast, but conserve enough energy to handle the assist and help tow him to safety. 
Stop near but out of the diver's reach. Evaluate his mental state to be sure he's not panicked. Note where his BCD inflator is and tell him to inflate his BCD or drop his weights. If the diver hasn't panicked, be sure you have ample buoyancy and make contact while telling the victim how you're going to help. Provide buoyancy by inflating the victim's BCD or dropping his weights. Reassure the diver with direct eye contact. If conditions allow, have the tired diver take his mask off, lie back and relax. Help the tired diver reach safety with a toe like the underarm push. Let the diver do as much for herself as possible. In most tired diver rescues, other than dropping weights to establish buoyancy, discarding equipment is a low priority. On the other hand, you may need to help the diver remove gear for a long swim or most likely to make it easier to get out of the water. Approach and evaluate a panic diver exactly the same as a tired diver. Stop and evaluate the diver's state of mind. Tell him to inflate his BCD or drop his weights and note where his BCD inflator is. Chances are the diver won't respond to your directions. Assess the diver's strength and size compared to you to determine whether to approach on the surface or underwater. A surface approach is faster, but riskier for the rescuer. The underwater approach is safer for the rescuer, but will take a bit longer. It's the best choice if you're smaller and weaker than the victim. If you decide on a surface approach, begin by establishing substantial positive buoyancy. Try to swim around behind the victim, beyond the victim's reach. Take control by grabbing the victim's tank valve and assuming the knee cradle position, which prevents the victim from being able to turn and climb on you. Establish buoyancy by dropping the victim's weights or inflating the BCD or both. Instead of swimming, you can also grab the victim's opposite wrist and then spin her facing away as you pull her toward you. Use the knee cradle position and establish buoyancy. For an underwater approach, descend quickly and approach between knee and ankle depth. Remove the diver's weights if possible and swim around behind him or use his legs to turn him away from you. Come up behind the diver into the knee cradle position and inflate the diver's BCD or drop the weights if you weren't able to underwater. Once a panic diver's buoyant and out of immediate danger of sinking, he'll usually calm down and relax. Reassure the diver and help him to safety the same way you did the tired diver. If you get caught in a panic diver's grasp, you'll use a release to get away and regain control. The surest release is to descend. Underwater is the last place a panic diver wants to go. Another release is to inflate your own and the victim's BCD. Their volume pushes you apart and establishes buoyancy at the same time. You can also release by pushing the victim up and away from you, then swim out of reach. The best release to use often depends on the circumstances and your size and strength relative to the victim's. If you can't safely control the victim, your only option may be to stay clear until he exhausts himself and passes out. Then rescue using the unresponsive diver at the surface techniques that you'll learn later in the course. Section 2 of the Paddy Rescue Diver course builds upon what you learned in Section 1. You'll learn more about recognizing diver stress and what to do about it. To help in being prepared for an emergency, this section covers how scuba gear operates and typical gear-related problems that can lead to accidents. You'll learn some basic first aid principles specific to aquatic life injuries and then more about rescuing tired and panicked divers at the surface. In Section 1, you learn that stress is a natural response to real or perceived threats. Managed with proper responses, stress can lead to solutions, 
but unmanaged, it can lead to panic and accidents. As a paddy rescue diver, you want to be able to recognize stress in yourself and others. The first sign is direct observation. Look for behavioral changes, such as inappropriate irritability, silence, excessive talkativeness, or hesitation. But these behaviors may not mean stress, especially if you don't really know the person. In that case, the simplest thing is to privately ask how the diver feels about the dive. It's important to avoid creating peer pressure when you do this by being open, caring, and non-judgmental. If you discover a diver has undue stress and anxiety about a dive, you want to break the stress response cycle. A diver who has an overwhelmingly irrational fear of sharks might panic at the sight of one, for example. Begin with problem recognition by making sure the diver understands the cause of his stress. Discuss the problem with the diver and encourage solution thinking. Help to form a plan to handle the problem causing the stress. Successfully implementing the plan, or being prepared to if it's a potential problem that's causing stress, should eliminate or reduce the stress, preventing more serious problems. Scuba diving's a technical activity with extensive equipment requirements compared to many other recreations. Equipment can be the source of problems either directly because it malfunctions or indirectly because a diver misuses or abuses it. Equipment malfunctions are actually very rare in gear that's maintained and serviced according to manufacturer recommendations. Nonetheless, problems can arise so you'll want a basic familiarity with how equipment works so you can more easily spot potential problems. See Patty's Encyclopedia of Recreational Diving for details on how various equipment pieces work, and see the Patty Rescue Diver Manual for lists and descriptions of common function-related problems. As a rescue diver, you want to watch for equipment misuse or abuse that can lead to problems. Problems can arise when a diver uses specialized equipment without proper instruction or practice, or equipment that doesn't fit or is inappropriate for the environment. Another trouble source comes from using makeshift homemade gear in place of proper equipment. Sometimes the issue is not having the equipment, as when a diver goes in lacking one or more pieces of essential gear. In trying to solve one problem, like this loose weight belt, divers sometimes over-modify their gear to the point it doesn't work as intended. This quick-release buckle can't quick-release. By far the biggest problems are failing to check and inspect equipment before diving with it and failing to maintain it. The pre-dive safety check and regular maintenance go a long way toward preventing problems. Scuba equipment releases deserve special attention because they can cause problems if not properly closed or damaged or misused. The Paddy Rescue Diver Manual lists the most commonly encountered problems. Through your first aid training, you're already familiar with basic emergency treatment and aid for cuts, bites, and other injuries. Let's expand on your training to include injuries caused by contact with aquatic life. Begin with primary assessment, just as you learned in emergency first response. If it's a non-venomous bite, scrape, or cut, handle it as you would any wound, making sure the patient gets medical attention to prevent infection. Venomous animal injuries can cause a variety of symptoms, including severe pain, swelling and inflammation, weakness and paralysis, nausea, mental confusion, unconsciousness, and respiratory and cardiac arrest. Your priority is basic life support and assuring the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. Next, remove any spines, stingers, or other foreign objects from the wound using forceps. Protect your hands and eyes so you don't get stung too. Soak the afflicted area with hot water 43 to 49 degrees Celsius, 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, for at least 30 to 90 minutes. Or use hot compresses if you can't soak it. 
Keep an injured limb below heart level and monitor for shock while waiting for emergency care to arrive. Jellyfish, sea wasps, Portuguese man-of-war, and stings from similar invertebrates take the same first aid. Again, your priority is basic life support, with these stings ranging from painful to life-threatening. After assuring the ABCDs, rinse the injury site of remaining tentacles with seawater, not fresh water, which can make the sting worse. Protect your hands because stinging cells can still sting, even detached from the animal. Neutralize remaining stinging cells with a 5% acetic acid solution like vinegar or household ammonia diluted one part ammonia to three parts water. It may help to shave the area clean with shaving cream and a safety razor followed by more acetic acid. Finish with hot packs to break down the venom. In rescue training session one, you learned the basics for helping tired and panicked divers. In rescue training session two, you'll practice responding from shore, using flotation aids, considerations when two or more people need help, toes, and exits. Let's look at what to do if you have to get into the water to rescue a responsive diver at the surface from a distance. Keep your eyes on the victim and get your mask, fins, and snorkel. They'll usually save you more time than it takes to get them. If you're wearing a buoyant exposure suit, you may need weights to snorkel down if the victim sinks. You can ditch the weights once you've made contact. Don your gear and enter the water as close as you can to the victim to minimize swimming distance. Keep your eyes on him the whole time and, if possible, get bystanders to point to the victim in case you lose sight of him. Enter without splashing or going under so you don't lose sight of the victim. Pace yourself so you can get there quickly but conserve enough energy for the rescue and tow to safety. Swim with your head up and eye on the diver. You can use your arms to save your leg strength for towing, but save enough arm strength for the rescue. Set your pace based on the environment and the distance. When you stop to evaluate the diver, be prepared to quick reverse by leaning back with your feet toward him. This puts you in position to kick away if he approaches you. You'll practice this move in rescue training session two. If available, you'll want to take emergency flotation with you when you assist a tired or panicked diver or have someone throw flotation to grab on the way out. Keep the flotation between you and the victim and extend it to him. Flotation simplifies the rescue by providing immediate buoyancy and allowing you to avoid contact. You may find it easiest to tow the diver to safety by the flotation device. If you don't have a flotation aid, you may be able to improvise one quickly. Otherwise, you'll have to rescue the diver without one like you've already learned. It's rare, but it's possible to be in a situation requiring you to help two divers at once. Your best options are non-swimming assists and having multiple rescuers, but that's not always possible. A flotation aid of any sort will greatly simplify the rescue. Give flotation to the diver who appears in the most urgent trouble. Making sure that solves the immediate problem, go assist the other. You may need to separate two panic divers. Inflating both their BCDs from behind or from underwater usually accomplishes this, plus solves the immediate problem by making them buoyant. If handling more than one panic diver presents unacceptable risk, stay clear until one or both exhaust themselves. Remember, to be able to help, you must stay out of trouble. In rescue training session one, you practice towing the victim to safety. Let's look at some other towing and exit considerations and techniques. After the initial assist, when you're ready to head to safety, you may want to consider removing equipment. If you're close to the boat or shore, that's seldom necessary. 
but if you have a long tow and swim ahead, equipment removal may save time and energy. You need to consider the environment. An exit through rough water may be more effective with scuba gear to breathe from. In that case, you probably wouldn't ditch any gear. Consider the diver's condition. A fully recovered diver may not need to get rid of any gear. A very tired diver in a buoyant exposure suit, on the other hand, may recover faster and get to safety quicker with the equipment's bulk and drag eliminated. In rescue training session one, you used one or more toes. The ideal toe keeps the victim's face out of the water, reduces drag by keeping both of you relatively horizontal, doesn't restrict your swimming, and lets you maintain eye-to-eye -eye contact and communication. Different toes accomplish these to differing degrees. The underarm toe reassures the diver with good communication, eye contact, and direct control and support. The modified swimmer's carry, or push, is less tiring if you have a long way to go and has adequate face-to-face -face contact. The tank valve toe doesn't offer eye contact or ideal communication, but it is the fastest toe. It's a good choice for a quick dash to a boat or shore nearby. Getting the diver out of the water has its own considerations. How you handle it will depend on the victim's condition, the environment, how much assistance you have, and other variables. If you have not done so already, you may need to help a tired or weak diver out of his gear near the exit. But again, you need to consider the environment. Keeping gear on may be the better choice in circumstances where you need the equipment for an effective exit. To assist a very tired diver walk out, put his arm across your shoulder and your arm around his waist to provide support and balance. If the victim's too weak to walk or must keep his gear on for the conditions, it may be better for him to crawl out. You simplify exits into a boat by removing equipment in the water and by providing the diver with support if necessary. Sometimes you can make a difficult exit easy just by giving the diver time to rest and recover. After recovery, the diver may be able to exit with much less help. Once on the boat or shore, you have three concerns to address. First, assess the diver's condition and attend to injuries if present. Second, contact emergency medical care if necessary. Third, even if the diver wasn't hurt physically, be sensitive to emotions. As appropriate, talk to the diver privately at the right time. Don't play the hero, especially at the diver's expense. Some divers may experience self-esteem loss and residual fear. Without minimizing what happened, reassure the diver, emphasizing what he did right. In the first two sections of the Paddy Rescue Diver course, you started developing your emergency management skills. Section 3 develops these further by showing you how to develop emergency action plans and by applying the first aid and CPR skills you already have to diving circumstances. You'll also develop your skills for underwater emergencies and handling missing diver emergencies. One way to make rescue efforts go more quickly and smoothly is to have an emergency action plan. An emergency action plan is simply the information you need if you have to handle an accident at a particular site or area. Generally, the plan may consider local hazards, team member roles and local emergency services. It may include a sequence of steps to follow. Emergency contact numbers, a script for what to say to emergency personnel, procedures and considerations for evacuating the patient into emergency care, and considerations that might apply to locally required incident reports. Emergency action plans give you the basis for practicing your rescue skills to learn and be prepared for an accident. You can identify areas to improve and revise the plan based on what you learn. 
an emergency action plan doesn't have to be complex. In developed areas with sophisticated emergency medical response, the plan may be as simple as call 911. Professional dive operations normally have and maintain emergency action plans, sometimes set up and coordinated by the entire local dive community. In such a setting, in an emergency, your role as a rescue diver would likely be as a skilled team member assisting a dive master or instructor. When diving in a remote location away from a dive operation, you may need a very detailed and thought out emergency action plan. From your CPR and first aid training, you know that BLS, basic life support, includes monitoring a patient's breathing and circulation, and providing rescue breaths and chest compressions as necessary in an attempt to continue getting oxygen to body tissues. Dive accidents may lead to drowning, decompression sickness or lung overexpansion injuries. Exposure to the hot sun in heavy exposure suits can cause heat exhaustion or heat stroke and prolonged exposure to cold water can cause hypothermia. All of these emergencies can cause respiratory and cardiac arrest. Some forms of diving and some conditions can cause high physical demands leading to heart attack or stroke in predisposed individuals. These are not dive accidents per se, but heavy exertion in diving can trigger these conditions just like any other physical activity. As a paddy rescue diver, you'll learn to begin providing basic life support to an accident victim still in the water by opening the airway and providing rescue breathing if needed. However, you won't give chest compressions in the water. A diver without a heartbeat must be on a hard, flat surface for effective compressions. As you already know, time is critical for someone who needs rescue breathing or CPR. In diving, it's harder to assess a diver's condition and you can only do so much in the water. Your focus must be on providing rescue breaths and CPR as quickly as possible without compromising your own safety. The first aid and CPR protocols you've learned still apply in dive accidents, though you have to adapt them. For instance, it may be a 10-minute swim to get a victim out of the water for CPR, but a yell for help might get emergency medical care activated sooner. Primary assessment, as you know, is assessing someone's situation and condition so you can provide the right care with the right priority. Let's see how you would do this in a diving context. First, assess the situation. Look for hazards that might have injured the victim, such as stinging organisms or a boat. Be sure you're safe. Second, tap and shout to check responsiveness. Turn a face-down diver face up. Third, call for help if the diver doesn't respond. And fourth, remove the mask and regulator and open the airway. You'll learn in-water techniques for this later in the course. Fifth, Check for breathing. This dive is breathing. You would begin rescue breaths if she weren't. The sixth step is to check for a heartbeat, which you don't do in the water because it's almost impossible to confirm a heartbeat and you can't provide CPR in the water anyway. A breathing diver may be assumed to have a heartbeat and you would check for heartbeat with a non-breathing diver first thing upon getting the patient out of the water. Checking for bleeding is the seventh step if you have a breathing diver. In diving contexts, a responsive diver will be able to tell you where to look. Massive bleeding is obvious in water, but smaller yet serious wounds may not be. Look for slices or gashes in the exposure suit. Water can slow the body's clotting mechanism, but direct pressure and elevation above the surface, if possible, will work. Pressure points may be difficult or impossible to apply through an exposure suit. As soon as you're able, and while doing the above, you should be towing the victim to safety. Again, use common sense and good judgement. If help's immediately at hand, emergency care may begin, and more effectively, with many people helping. 
Shock management is the final primary assessment step. The previous steps have helped minimise shock. After getting the diver into a safe environment and assuring breathing, circulation and control of bleeding, continue with shock management as you learned in the emergency first response course. Shock, which may be characterised by shallow, rapid breathing, clammy skin, weak, rapid heartbeat, restlessness and anxiety and confusion, is possible after any injury specific to diving. Keep the patient lying down. In some climates, you may have to cut an exposure suit off a weak patient to prevent overheating or overchilling. You begin a secondary assessment only after determining that no immediate life-threatening conditions exist. If necessary, contact emergency medical care or send someone to do so. Keep the injured diver in the position you found him and examine him as you've learned, looking for deformities and pain. An exposure suit may interfere with a secondary assessment, but if you suspect neck or back injury, you shouldn't try to remove it. Instead, immobilise the diver's head just as you would in any other suspected back or spine injury situation. It may be necessary to cut the suit away to prevent overheating while waiting for EMS. If there's no reason to suspect neck or spine injury, you can begin first aid for any injuries found during secondary assessment. Monitor the patient's lifeline until emergency care arrives. Although underwater problems, like running out of air, are obvious and dramatic, many are more subtle. Watch for trouble signs, like hard, rapid breathing and inefficient, awkward kicking. Dog paddling with the hands usually indicates a diver's struggling. A panicked diver underwater may have wide eyes. He tends to be vertical in the water, breathing heavily, just before bolting for the surface using his hands in a desperate dog paddle. Although rare, a panic diver may lapse into passive panic characterised by a near trance-like state. Such a diver may be totally unaware that you're there or what you're doing to help. How you help with an underwater problem varies with the problem and circumstances. Have an overexerting diver stop and rest ideally hanging onto something stationary. A properly weighted recreational diver in a wetsuit should not have an uncontrolled descent even with a failed BCD. But it can happen with a flooded dry suit or if a diver's overweighted. Often all you need to do is signal the diver to adjust his buoyancy. If necessary though, Make contact and arrest the descent by adding air to his or your own BCD. You may need to surface to correct the cause. The opposite problem, an underweighted diver, will only have more difficulty as the dive progresses as his tank gets lighter. Help the diver control his ascent, surface and adjust the weight. Losing weights, a stuck inflator valve on a BCD or dry suit or improper dry suit techniques can cause a runaway ascent. Make contact and deflate the diver's BCD or dry suit by the quick exhaust valve. Disconnect the inflator hose if it's stuck. If you can't stop or control the ascent, let go and signal the diver to flare out and slow the ascent with drag. Surface at a safe rate if necessary to check on the diver's condition but don't risk getting hurt too, or you won't be able to help. The most common cramp in diving is in the calf. Help the affected diver by holding her fin tip so she can push against it to stretch the muscle. Gently massage the muscle and give it a chance to rest before moving on again at a slower pace. Entanglement and entrapment can occur, but are relatively rare. In both cases, first have the diver stop everything. Your first concern is to assure the victim has enough air while trying to free the diver. Assuming adequate air supply, have an entangled diver hold still while you slowly disentangle her. Use a cutting tool with great care, only if it's obvious the disentanglement isn't working or will take too long.
see the Paddy Rescue Dive Manual for more detail about entrapment. If you suspect passive panic, confirm by signalling OK and checking for response. If the diver doesn't respond, take him to the surface holding his regulator in place. Be cautious because a diver in passive panic can go to active panic without warning. At the surface, establish buoyancy and tow the diver to safety. With active panic underwater, your primary concern is to prevent a rapid breath-holding ascent. With a breathing panic diver, simply slowing the ascent is your best bet for controlling the rate and getting her to breathe. With an out-of-air panic diver, delaying the ascent may be enough to get her to take your alternate air source. Assume that a panic diver without her regulator is holding her breath. If she won't take your alternate, you may have to push it into her mouth while gently pushing the purge to keep it clear. Even if she begins breathing, the panic diver will likely continue her rush to the surface, so flare to control the ascent. At the surface, establish buoyancy for the victim and calm her down. Stay close and assess the diver for lung overexpansion injuries or other problems that may require further attention and care. A missing diver is a potentially serious situation because if the victim is underwater and not breathing, permanent brain damage can occur in about six minutes. Time is critical and the conservative course is to assume the worst until you can account for the diver. How you respond will depend on the environment and resources you have at hand. When it's apparent that a diver's missing, follow these steps as best you can. Have someone contact emergency medical services or other appropriate authority while you find out where the diver was last seen. Assign people to watch for bubbles and try to determine if the diver may have left the area without telling anyone. If available, immediately assign qualified diver teams to gear up for an underwater search. In clear water and good conditions, send out a snorkelling team because they can enter the water and search faster from the surface. When conducting a search, start where the diver was seen last. Descend without swimming, so you drift the same way an unresponsive diver would. Random searching is slower and less effective than a methodical search. There are four patterns commonly used to look for missing divers. The first is the U pattern search, which allows you to cover a large area with only a compass. It's a good choice when you have several search teams covering different parts of a large area. The expanding square is a good choice when you have only one search team. It's effective in moderate visibility and on irregular bottoms, and you need only a compass. It's most useful when you believe the missing diver isn't far from the start point. A circular search allows you to search a large area rapidly in poor visibility. However, it requires a line and reel, and doesn't work well when there are many obstructions on the bottom. The surface-led search requires a boat or snorkeler, a line and several divers who are familiar with it. But it lets you search a large area of relatively shallow water quickly with the boat or snorkeler controlling the pattern. When searching for a missing diver, keep these considerations in mind. Permit searches only in buddy teams, making sure searches have ample air and no decompression time. Don't let searchers jeopardise themselves. Assign someone to keep track of the search teams so they don't get forgotten when the victim comes out of the water. If possible, establish a way to recall the searchers when the diver is found. This is especially important on a boat if the boat must leave to get the victim to emergency care. If there's no way to have a recall, set a time for all searchers to surface and check for your signal to come in. If you don't have qualified divers present to search, you may have to choose a buddy and do it yourself. Search until you find the missing diver, until you reach an air, depth or no decompression limit, or for no more than 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, discontinue the search 
and turn it over to professionals. You've learned a good bit about the mental state of accident victims. But in Section 4, you'll look at some of the psychological effects handling an emergency can have on you. Next, this section gets into the nature of pressure-related injuries and the specific first aid for them, as well as for near-drowning patients. Finally, in preparation for rescue training Session 4, you'll learn the specific techniques for emergencies with unresponsive divers at the surface, underwater, and considerations about equipment removal. Any rescuer or witness who's involved with a serious accident or emergency may experience critical incident stress in its aftermath. It is an acute mental stress that impairs or overcomes someone's ability to cope emotionally and is most likely if the patient ended up permanently disabled or dead. Critical incident stress can occur immediately or sometime after the accident, with signs and symptoms including confusion, restlessness, denial, guilt or depression, anger and anxiety. It can cause behavioral changes that affect mood, appetite, personal interactions and cause sleeplessness or nightmares. If you experience critical incident stress, don't leave it untreated. Professional counseling helps those with critical incident stress learn to understand and cope with their feelings so they don't become lasting emotional problems. Many of the medical emergencies you might face as a rescue diver are the same as those in all walks of life. But diving also presents a risk of pressure-related injury. As you probably recall, Decompression sickness is a pressure-related injury caused by excess nitrogen gas dissolved into body tissues due to pressure at depth. Upon ascent, the dissolved nitrogen dissolves out of the tissues into the lungs. But if dissolved nitrogen exceeds certain limits, it may form bubbles in the tissues that cause decompression sickness by blocking blood flow and causing other damage. Lung overexpansion injuries result when a diver holds the breath during ascent. Expanding air in the lungs causes lung rupture, resulting in air entering the bloodstream as bubbles. These bubbles block blood flow and cause damage by depriving tissues of the oxygen they need. In the field, it's often difficult to distinguish whether a patient has decompression sickness or lung overexpansion injury. Since the first aid is the same, however, it's not important. Therefore, with respect to emergency protocols in the field, the specific cause isn't important and you refer to both conditions together as decompression illness. Decompression illness symptoms include pain in the joints, nausea, fatigue, dizziness, extreme fatigue, paralysis, unconsciousness, and cardiac arrest. Lung overexpansion injuries result when scuba divers ascend holding their breath, or, though it is uncommon, when trapping blocks air in a portion of the lungs. There are four possible lung overexpansion injuries. The first and most serious is air embolism, also called arterial gas embolism. This occurs when expanding air forces its way through the lungs into the surrounding capillaries with the resulting bubbles flowing to the heart and the rest of the body. If bubbles go to the brain, which they commonly do, they block blood flow and cause stroke-like symptoms. However, the bubbles can cause serious damage wherever they go. If expanding air forces its way between the lung and chest wall, it may collapse the lung. This is called pneumothorax and is characterized by severe chest pain and breathing difficulties. Expanding air can also find its way into the chest cavity between the lungs, causing mediastinal emphysema. This causes difficulty breathing, fainting, shock, and cyanosis, which is blueness of the skin. Expanding air can travel up through the chest and accumulate under the skin around the neck and collarbone. This is called subcutaneous emphysema, 
which can cause neck swelling, voice changes, and difficulty swallowing. More than one of the lung overexpansion injuries can happen at once, and all are considered serious conditions demanding prompt first aid and emergency medical care. You begin care for a diver with suspected decompression illness, DCI for short, with a primary assessment just as you would any patient. The priorities remain airway, breathing, and circulation. Assume an unresponsive diver has DCI, but give priority to airway, rescue breathing, and CPR if needed. Keep the patient lying down. Field experience has shown that the symptoms may worsen in DCI patients who sit or stand. Refer to the flowchart on the Diving Accident Management Work Slate for the steps in providing DCI care. The specific first aid for DCI is emergency oxygen. Have a breathing patient breathe 100% oxygen from a non-resuscitator demand valve emergency oxygen system. Give a non-breathing patient oxygenated air with the unit's free flow setting. You'll learn the specifics of oxygen system use in Section 5 of this course. Protect the patient from excessive heat or cold, monitor his lifeline, and treat for shock while arranging for emergency medical care. Drowning occurs when someone suffocates from being underwater and cannot be revived. Near drowning occurs when the victim can be revived. Near drowning can result from exhaustion, panic, or other causes in the water. Begin with a primary assessment and rescue breathing if necessary, regardless of the time the victim's been underwater. A breathing patient may have shortness of breath, coughing, or convulsions. Administer emergency oxygen and get the patient into emergency medical care. Note that even a patient who appears fully recovered needs medical examination to prevent possible complications that can arise several hours later. Let's look at the specific techniques for the unresponsive diver at the surface. You'll be practicing these during rescue training session four. Approach an apparently unresponsive diver, splashing and yelling to get her attention. Make contact and confirm unresponsiveness. Turn a face-down diver face up. You can do this by crossing your arms and grabbing his wrists, like this. Drop the victim's weights and your own to assure buoyancy and call for help if possible. Remove the victim's mask and regulator and your own if necessary. And open the airway by lifting the chin and tilting the head. Look, listen, and feel for breathing for 10 seconds. Although it's rare in dive circumstances, if you suspect neck injury, open the airway with the chin lift alone, tilting the head only if it's necessary to open the airway. If the diver's breathing, begin towing to safety while monitoring breathing and protecting the airway from splashes. If the diver's not breathing, give two slow rescue breaths and then begin towing to safety, giving a breath every five seconds. If you miss a breath for any reason, resume with two slow breaths. Estimate how far you are from safety. If you're less than five minutes away, continue providing rescue breaths while towing the victim there. Get the diver out of the water perform a heart check and primary assessment, and continue with rescue breathing, CPR, or both as necessary. If you're more than five minutes from safety, provide rescue breathing for an additional minute, checking for any movement or response to your breaths. If there are none, the victim is probably in cardiac arrest. Discontinue rescue breathing and tow to safety as quickly as possible for a primary assessment and to begin CPR as needed. If the victim does move or react to your breaths, continue rescue breathing while towing the victim to safety. In handling unresponsive diver emergencies, don't neglect your own safety. Consider the environment and circumstances. You want to begin rescue breaths if needed as soon as possible, but it may be necessary to tow the victim away from a hazard as quickly as possible before beginning. 
you will learn and practice three techniques for in-water rescue breathing. Mouth to pocket mask, mouth to mouth, and mouth to snorkel. Mouth to pocket mask is probably the most effective in-water rescue breathing method and has the added benefit of reducing disease transmission risk. Pull out your pocket mask as you approach the victim. After confirming the need for rescue breathing, move above the victim. Place the mask on the diver's face with your fingers under the jawbone and your thumbs on top. Draw the head back to open the airway and give two slow rescue breaths. Tow the diver to safety while giving a rescue breath every five seconds, monitoring for breathing and protecting the airway. If you don't have a pocket mask, you'll use mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breathing. At the diver's side, open the airway by running your arm closest to his feet, under his arm, and up behind to grab and support the head by hood, BCD, or hair. With the other hand, pinch the nose and press down on the forehead. Use the underside arm to roll the diver toward you for a mouth-to-mouth -mouth seal. This is called the do -si do method. Give two slow rescue breaths, then tow to boat or shore giving a breath every five seconds, checking for breathing and protecting the airway. If you're significantly smaller than the victim, or when wearing heavy exposure suits like dry suits, the head cradle position may be more effective. The drawback is it's not easy to roll the diver to you, so you may have to rise above the victim to give each breath. This is more tiring, and you have to be careful to not push him underwater. Another variation is mouth-to-nose, which is suited to situations in which equipment makes it difficult to keep the mouth open. This can happen with a victim in a heavy dry suit or hood, for example. It's also easier to protect the airway by pinching the nose, making this an option in rough water. Mouth-to-snorkel rescue breathing is used for towing. Note that a snorkel with a self-drain valve won't work. You check for breathing and give the first two breaths using mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, then move above the victim. Place the drained snorkel in the victim's mouth, using one hand to make a seal and pinch the nose, with the other holding the tube against the head, making sure the tip stays out of the water. Tow the diver, giving rescue breaths through the snorkel. With an unresponsive diver underwater, getting the victim to the surface takes priority over everything else except your own safety. Circumstances will affect the best way to handle it, but here are the basic steps. As you approach, note the diver's condition, whether gear is in place or any clues to what caused the accident. Don't stop to do this, just pay attention as you arrive. Position yourself behind the diver. If the regulator's in the mouth, hold it there. If not, don't waste time trying to put it back. Keep the diver's head in a normal position so expanding air in the lungs can escape. It's important to ascend under control. Use your BCD. You may have to vent the victim's BCD as well as your own to control your ascent rate. If the diver is too heavy, you may have to release her weights. Otherwise, you can do that when you reach the surface. If you can't control the ascent, let the victim go and ascend safely on your own. Regain contact and resume the rescue at the surface. As you ascend, think about the situation and plan your next step. At the surface, drop the victim's weights to assure buoyancy. Open the airway, check for breathing, and continue as you already learned for an unresponsive diver at the surface. In some circumstances, you may find it advantageous to remove a victim's equipment, your own, or both. It depends on the circumstances. You should only remove equipment to make the rescue effort decidedly more effective or faster, and consider when as well as what to remove. Equipment removal takes a very low priority, except for removing weights to assure buoyancy and discarding anything that interferes with an open airway and rescue breathing. When you're not far from help, 
removal slows down getting the victim to safety and additional help. That doesn't make much sense. Just leave the gear on and get there. But if you have a long tow ahead of you, you may go so much faster without gear that you more than make up for the time it takes to ditch it. So in this situation, removing gear from yourself, the victim, or both makes sense. You may need to remove gear for your exit, but again, go with what's fastest and most effective. It's easier and faster to remove equipment in water you can stand in, so it may be fastest to tow the victim there first, then get rid of gear. And think about what you need to keep. If you need your mask to exit through surf, for example, you need to hang on to it. The point is, don't just automatically start removing gear in an emergency. Focus on what gives the victim the best chances and do that. If equipment removal is the right decision, start by thinking about buoyancy. If you and the victim are in buoyant exposure suits, you can get rid of the scuba units. But if not, you may need to keep them so you have the BCD for flotation. The exact order you get rid of stuff isn't important. What is important is that you keep swimming toward the boat or shore and that you maintain the airway. You should always have a hand on the victim's head to keep the airway open. If needed, you must keep giving rescue breaths. Get a rhythm going with priority to the breaths, not the gear removal. Remember also that just because you take something off the diver doesn't mean it has to come off of you and that what you might ditch in one environment, you'd keep in another. A good example is that while you'd normally drop your own weights, in dry suits you may find you're too buoyant to give effective rescue breaths without them. In that instance, you would dump the victim's weights but keep yours, assuming you still have adequate buoyancy. Keep in mind also that technical diving, with its extensive amount of gear, makes it more likely you'll need to remove it. Many tech diving harnesses fit tightly and your best bet is often to cut them off the diver. Congratulations! You've reached Section 5, the last in the course. You've covered a lot of ground to get here. In Section 5, you learn how to complete an incident report after an accident, should you be required to. You learn the specific steps for using an emergency oxygen system in a diving emergency, how to manage an accident scene while waiting for help, and how to exit the water with an unresponsive diver. After an accident that requires summoning emergency medical care or professional help, you may be asked or required to complete an incident report. Factual information from the report can help investigators determine what happened in the hope that future similar accidents can be avoided or emergency personnel can be prepared better. Be aware that accident reports may ultimately be used as legal documents, so it's important to be as factual and objective as possible. Avoid speculating or offering opinions. You may also have reporters ask you about an accident. Be aware that following an accident, you seldom have all the facts and tend to be in an unobjective, emotional state. Inaccurate comments may be taken as fact and create problems for those trying to determine the facts. The best response to media questions is, an accident investigation is underway, so I'm not in a position to answer questions. Please get a statement from the authorities when they have completed their investigation. As you learned in Section 4, the appropriate first aid for suspected decompression illness is emergency oxygen. This is a community standard because field experience shows that oxygen may significantly benefit a diver with DCI. Prompt emergency oxygen can make subsequent recompression more effective and may decrease the risk of permanent injury. Although non-resuscitator oxygen systems are very similar to scuba systems, they have some special considerations. First, handle them with care and keep them in their protective cases. Oxygen makes things burn rapidly, so extinguish smoking materials and flames before using it. Oxygen equipment requires special lubrication. Never use silicone grease on it. 
Likewise, avoid contaminating oxygen equipment with oils or grease, including suntan oil. Keep your oxygen system assembled in its case so it's ready to go in an emergency and be sure to have it professionally serviced as required by the manufacturer. For a breathing diver, responsive or unresponsive, you will use the system's demand system. Open the kit. Slowly open the valve and check the pressure. Inhale from the mask to confirm its function but don't exhale into it. Secure the cylinder by cradling it in the case so it can't roll or fall, but so you can still read the pressure. Tell the injured diver, this is oxygen, it will help you. May I give it to you? Assuming the diver says yes, put the mask on his face and tell him to breathe normally. You may assume that an unresponsive diver would say yes. This is called implied consent. A responsive diver may hold the mask himself, which is reassuring. Monitor the supply. Don't let it run empty on an unresponsive diver. If the patient's very weak and cannot use the demand mask, use the unit's free flow setting and the non rebreather mask. Attach the mask to the free flow outlet and set the flow for 15 litres per minute. Hold your thumb over the mask inlet until the bag inflates. Tell the diver, this is oxygen, it will help you, may I give it to you? After the diver says yes, place the mask on his face. If the bag deflates completely when he inhales, set the flow for 25 litres per minute. Again, watch the pressure gauge to avoid running out while the mask is on the patient's face. You use the free flow outlet also when giving rescue breaths to a non-breathing diver. Have someone set up the system for you while providing breaths. Don't let oxygen interfere with either rescue breaths or CPR if they're needed. Set the flow rate for 15 litres per minute and attach the tube to the inlet on the pocket mask. This adds oxygen to each rescue breath. If the patient begins breathing independently, Switch to the demand system or the non rebreather mask. After you have a patient under care and emergency medical services on the way, you must manage the scene until they arrive. Your priority is to constantly monitor the patient's airway, breathing and circulation, provide rescue breathing, CPR, and if available, AED defibrillation as necessary and appropriate. Protect the patient against hot or cold. Control bystanders so the area is clear for medical personnel. Pressure-related injuries almost always require recompression in a hyperbaric chamber. So maintain contact with DAN or other local diver emergency services. Give a patient with suspected DCI oxygen until emergency care arrives. If they're delayed, or you find yourself running low on oxygen for some other reason, give 100% oxygen, or the highest concentration possible, as long as you can. This is better than trying to conserve it. If you run out of oxygen, but there's enriched air nitrox available, you can administer that to a responsive diver with a scuba regulator. It may or may not help, but it certainly won't hurt. Be prepared to give emergency medical personnel the patient's name, any significant medical history, the first aid given, dive profile information, any comments relevant to emergency care, and contact information for DAN or other local diver emergency service. The Paddy Accident Management Work Slate puts all this in one place. In Rescue Training Session 4, you practised handling breathing and non-breathing unresponsive diver emergencies in the water. Now let's look at what to do when you get to a boat or shore. Before exiting, you'll need to remove most of your gear and the victim's gear without interrupting rescue breaths. The actual exit may require an interruption though. If so, first give two slow breaths interrupt for no longer than 30 seconds 
and resume with two slow breaths again. The technique you use for the actual exit will depend on your strength, relative size to the diver, and the environment. The saddleback carry and fireman's carry work well when the victim's relatively small and light. The pack strap carry is one of the most popular because you can more easily carry a larger diver than with the other two carries. But when all else fails, don't worry about doing anything fancy. Dragging someone out of the water is fine when necessary. There are numerous exits onto a dock or boat. One of the most useful if you don't have help is the lifeguard exit, which you can use to bring someone onto a low dock or platform. The ladder carry can help if you must exit to a relatively high point. However, you must be fairly strong for this exit, and so must the ladder. And to get out of the water without assistance, the first rungs of the ladder need to be below water level. Your instructor will have you practice different exits to find the best ones for you and your local diving conditions. Environment and conditions may greatly complicate exits. For instance, Exits through surf make it harder to protect the diver's airway. The pocket mask, which you can easily seal, is perhaps the easiest way to protect the airway when dealing with surf. Exits onto rocks, especially with surf, can be the most problematic. The difficulty and risk is such that it's usually worth swimming to a more distant exit point without rocks. If that's not possible, be careful and use the water to carry you and the victim up the rocks in stages. If you expect help quickly, you can avoid a difficult exit altogether by waiting for it to arrive. Help can make any part of a rescue easier, so always ask for it if it's available. Your priorities are providing rescue breaths and contacting emergency medical care. But in some situations, it may be impossible to get out of the water with no more than a 30-second interruption, especially if you're alone. Do the best you can. The victim has more of a chance out of the water with medical services on the way than in it without help on the way. Congratulations you've almost completed the Paddy Rescue Diver course. After finishing rescue training session five, you'll complete four rescue scenarios in a typical local open water site. As much as you can, treat these scenarios like real emergencies. If you've learned anything by now, it's that there's no one right way to rescue. You have to adapt based on the resources and the circumstances. The scenarios are your chance to learn to think, to plan, to adapt, and to learn in realistic simulated rescues. And you'll discover that you can do things not quite perfectly and still accomplish a competent rescue. You'll find them challenging, sometimes difficult, educational, but ultimately rewarding and worthwhile. Becoming a paddy rescue diver is an important step that can make a big difference in an emergency. One day, you may be a rescuer in an emergency, but the patient dies or lives the rest of his life with a serious permanent disability, despite all your efforts. It's important to understand that your skills don't guarantee happy endings. All you can do is give the diver more of a chance for a happy outcome, not certainty. Realise that all you can do is the best you can. If in the end your efforts made no difference to the outcome, Realise that you did make a difference by giving the patient every chance humanly possible. Don't tell yourself you failed. You didn't fail. Don't tell yourself, if only I'd... Because the fact is, you don't know, and can never know, whether anything would have made the slightest difference. Usually the reality is that nothing would have. When you help in a rescue, no matter what the ultimate outcome, you've done something wonderful. You've reached out to help another person, and that's not failure, it's compassion. Yeah.